Welcome to our midweek Bible study through the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, the series, this whole book, I've titled Judgment and Hope. <laughs> we'll kind of get both tonight. Uh, tonight we'll be in chapter 7 and the first part of chapter 8. And these chapters are all part of one message uh, that covers three chapters, chapters 7 through 9. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in and get started in this wonderful book. Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the message of the word. Thank you, Lord, for how the word makes you more real, and how it makes you come alive, and how it reminds us of the, the, those things that you want us to know and that we should remember, and that make a difference in our lives. So Lord, I pray that you would um, just uh, affect us tonight, Lord, that you would uh, anoint your word, and you would fill it with power, and it would go forth in the spirit with which it was given. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said, we're covering uh, a new section that, that lasts about three chapters. And in, these, in this section of Isaiah, he's using the events of the day, sort of the politics. Um, and it, the Lord's given us all a message in here to look beyond the immediate, look beyond with what we see and with what's happening right now, things that might cause us to panic, certainly cause us to worry, certainly causes great concern, and so on. And see past the immediate into the eternal, the realm of God, um, how he has us in our lives. Um, <laughs> it's kind of exciting to me reading this, because you see politics and religion intertwined. And in the Bible, they really, really do go together because the politics of Judah, of the nation of Israel, were just bound together with the ways and the law of God. The, the rule of God overseeing the people is called a theocracy, God ruling. Um, and that's ideally what... Um, the nation of Israel, the nation Judah and Israel are meant and were meant to have. I uh, just mention that because that word is going to come up a bit later from a, an old commentator. Well, in the last chapter, <laughs> or he's chapter six, uh, it was it was given in the in the year King Uzziah died. King Uzziah was a good king, reigned the longest of ever reigned, like fifty five years. Um, and his son Jotham um, replaced him, and he Jotham was a good king. But now, when this uh, reading takes place, both Uzziah and Jotham have dead, and Jotham's son Ahaz is on the throne. Um, Uzziah and Jotham are described in Scripture by as they were ones who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Ahaz has a different description. The uh, Bible says of him, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. It, it described him as walking in the ways of the kings of Israel. And he even burned his own son in an offering to the pagan gods. Mm. He has turned his back on the Lord, and he fully embraced the world's ways of, of acting and the devil's false religious method to gain peace. Uh, meanwhile, in the life of the nation and in the um, reign of, of Ahaz, major life-changing events were happening in the nations that surrounded uh, Judah and Israel. The mighty Assyrians were on the advance. Um, and the Assyrian uh, uh, Empire was threatening Judah and the smaller nations around her. Um, 
Assyria, which is uh, today in northern Iraq, uh, located there, was a very advanced um, people for its age, but they were an extremely cool people. Um, and their military had great success using shock and awe techniques. They would come overwhelming and committed great acts of cruelty upon uh, the leaders and the kings that would dare to resist uh, Assyria. So uh, there's not a people to be messed with. It was a people that everyone feared and were in great awe. And so what do you do about a people like this? Well, it turns out that Ahaz and all, as all the nations around them turned to their pagan gods for help and uh, all of the countries around Judah at this time, except Judah herself, entered into an alliance to oppose Assyria. Um, trouble was uh, with, um, with Ahaz not joining their alliances that angered the other nations, especially the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, and the king of um, Aram, or Syria, headquartered in Damascus. So, uh, those, two, uh, those two countries, those two very powerful and effective military leaders, came against Judah and had great success in their attack. Um, they... Uh, well, let, let me describe why they did this from this very helpful book that was lent to me by a dear sister in the church uh, called The King of the Jews. It's by Norman Gleb, Gelb, G-E-L-B. Norman Gelb um, quoted about this, uh, that those, those two countries, especially um, Israel and Aram or Syria, were fearing the presence of a potentially hostile nation at their rear when the likely Assyrian campaign against them was launched. So Israel and Damascus reacted by attacking the recalcitrant or resistant to agree uh, Judah, defeating their out, the outmatched Judean army. They overran much of the southern kingdom and looted its treasures and took hostages. They took hostages. Well, the 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 Arameans took hostages back to Damascus, and the um, Samaritans took hostages back to Israel, but were stopped by a prophet of, of God. There was a few left up north. Um, they said, "What are you doing? These are your brothers." And so they. They let their hostages go, but nonetheless, they ravaged uh, Judah. And they came and besieged Jerusalem. That is, uh, that is the king of, of, uh, of the forces of Israel, Samaria, and the forces of Aram, uh, Damascus. And that's where this chapter, chapter 7 of Isaiah, opens. <laughs> In typical dramatic fashion, God, like I said, has a sense, sense of drama. And it opens during that siege by these two, two nations against Jerusalem. And we read in the first verse, In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. But could not yet mount an attack against it. So they came up against Jerusalem, they besieged it, but they weren't able to overcome Jerusalem's defenses. That's why they, they ended up leaving and taking hostages and loot and with them as they, re, as they retreated back north. Um, Pekah, the king of Israel, had been reigning there for seventeen. <clears throat> had been reigning there seventeen years when Ahaz, at twenty years of age, became king of Judah. Um, Pekah had been the commander of Israel's chariot force, 
but had assassinated the previous king of Samaria to gain the throne there. He made it clear that he would not submit to rule by the Assyrians, Pekah did. Meanwhile, Ahab, who had resisted being recruited into the anti-Assyrian alliance, probably because, according to this, considered the formation of the anti-Assyrian coalition hopeless and uh, provocative and declined to be drawn in. He was going to make a deceptive uh, plans of his own. He had already determined in his heart to do this at this time when the Lord sends Isaiah to him to expose his thoughts and his heart and his motives to the light for all to see. So Ahaz looked around at what was going on. Assyria was threatening, and now he was being threatened by powerful and effective forces from the north, and uh, he looked for help wherever he, ever he could, except from the Lord. So now... Uh, the second verse of chapter 7. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz, and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So the word had come to them that Syria and Ephraim, that Ephraim was the largest tribe of the northern kingdom, so it was the, the sort of the nickname of the northern kingdom, or Israel, or Samaria, um, Ephraim, these two, when people heard, and Ahab heard, that these two people had aligned together and come against them, they were scared to death. As it says, their, their uh, knees shook like the trees of a forest before the wind. Um, did you have a question? Or, or, mm -mm. Okay. Um, no, I'm just saying that it sounds like today, that oh, they're looking for help everywhere but exactly, to the Lord. Exactly, exactly the point. It sounds like today, doesn't mm -hmm. it? You know, our governments, our, our leaders see problems and they look everywhere and try to make sense and do what's logical uh, for help. They look around, but they don't look up. <laughs> and what's the result? It's that, that, that phrase have here, no God, no peace, to know K-N-O-W. To know God, you'll know peace, but no God, no peace. The people wanted peace, peace in their minds, peace in their hearts, peace in their life, and they were looking everywhere except the real source of where it would come from. And it was not just Ahaz himself, but it said, uh, uh, is that the first verse? Okay, yeah, look at this in, in the second, second verse. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people. The people now were definitely the people of Ahaz and not the people of the Lord. They were not living uh, up to their reputation and not living up as they should. So the Lord decides to make a move and to remind Ahaz and the people how to find peace. Verse 3, And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Yashub. Shear Yashub was his firstborn son. Shear Yashub means a remnant shall remain, return. A remnant shall return. So you go, how would you like to name your kid or be named by your parents? Um, Shear Yashub. My name is a remnant shall return. <laughs> <laughs> not very exciting. But anyway, go and take your son um, and meet him at the end of the conduit at the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. <laughs> well, Shear Yashub's name was given to him as a prophetic, uh, sort of as a word of prophecy, is meaning to the name. Um, he's predicting distant results. The results of the Assyrian and, for Judah, Isaiah's people, the Babylonian exiles that were to come. It wouldn't happen 
at least to, to Judah for a few hundred years. Um, it would be a little more closer within a generation for the northern kingdom, but nonetheless, it's a prediction of the end of the exiles that will come from these attacking empires against the nation. Hmm. You know, because God knows, as it says, the end from the beginning. God sees all the time. He knows God does not panic. The people were panicking, but the Lord was not. And he wanted to come and give some of his confidence to the people. And there's only one way for them to, to latch on to get that confidence and that peace in the Lord. And that's to repent, to turn, and to give the Lord their whole heart. And so the Lord is, is, is not only speaking to their leader, but to all the people. Uh, verse 4 through 6. And say to him, say to Ahaz, be careful, be quiet. Do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, Israel and Syria, at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, oh, Rezin of, Sir, uh, of Syria and the son of Remaliah, uh, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have devised evil against you, saying, let's go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabiel as king in the midst of it. Oh man, now this time it's personal against Ahaz, as well as personal against the people of Judah. It's a direct threat in here to conquer Jerusalem by these enemies, the northern kingdoms, the brothers of Judah, have so far from the Lord. Um, for, for when they said, let us conquer it, it's really strong, vivid language. It says, let us split it open. We're going to hammer it, and you're going to collapse, and we're going to take all of these spoils too. And we're going to kill Ahaz and all his family and all his descendants, and we're going to set up a puppet king on the throne of Judah. So their threats were aimed directly at Ahaz and his people. But really, what this was aimed at, this threat was aimed at the Lord. Because they totally disbelieved and rejected God's promises to his people and his land. They rejected and didn't believe the covenant that the Lord had with the people of Israel and with Jerusalem as a permanent capital, with the land belonging to him and with the descendant of David forever on the throne. These guys had paid no, no reputation to the Lord's uh, direction, to the Lord's word, to the law of the Lord, um, but wanted their own ways and looked like they were going to get it. So the Lord gives this message of, of hope, of encouragement. And its purpose was to strengthen their faith, as weak and as, as faint as it was. Um, concerning those plans of Samaria and Damascus, this is what God has to say. Verses 7 through 9. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand their plans to, to defeat Jerusalem and put their king on the throne. It shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim, the northern kingdom, will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah, Pekah. If you, and this you is plural, he's not just, God is not just speaking to Ahaz, he's speaking to all the people with this great verse. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. 
Now, God, like I said, God sees the end from the beginning. Within two years, Pekah, king of Samaria, would be dead. He would be assassinated himself by a pro-Assyrian, Hoshea. Hoshea would be the final king of the northern kingdom. Samaria would fall to the Assyrians during the 11th year of Hoshea's reign. And within 65 years of this prophecy, the northern kingdom would be completely subjected and controlled by the Assyrians. And uh, you couldn't recognize it as being people of the Lord at all. Damascus would fall to the Assyrians within three years of this prophecy. The end of Aram as a nation. Like I said, God knows the end from the beginning. But he, so he says, it, in the ESV, puts it this way, the sort of tricky to translate phrase. If you, or as they say around here, if yous, because it's plural, <laughs> If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. That second term where it says you will not be firm at all, that word to be firm is, has the meaning of to be established, mm -hmm. to be made firm, to be sure, to be lasting. So this speaks both to Ahaz the king personally, as well as to the people and their nation. If you are not firm in the faith, you will not stand up. You will not last. You will not remain established. Your faith is the key to peace, is the key to success. Not putting your hope in advanced technology, not putting your hope into government, not putting your hope into uh, treasures and bank accounts, not putting your hope in people, not putting your hope in family, not putting your hope in anything except God himself, who can use all these things and will use these, these things in various ways at various times for our benefit and for our help. But we don't want to put the cart before the horse. We want to have faith in the Lord. And in doing so, you will be established. Faith first, firmness second. Makes me think of, of, of the parable that Jesus gave of the house built on the rock. And the storms came and the house stood firm as opposed to the house built on the sand. The storms came and the foundation was swept away and everything collapsed and disaster came. Well, the people of Judah are building their house personally in their lives and as a nation on sand, not on a, on a, on a sure foundation. Yeah. So the Lord knows, the Lord sees the heart of his people. At this point of time, they are not his people. They are Ahaz's people. And he wants all of that to change. Praise the Lord. At this time, we know what's going to happen by reading the scriptures, by reading the thing. The people will change. They will be rescued. God will raise up um, a descendant of Ahaz, his son, who will be one of the best kings ever and one of the last of the good kings for Judah. So faith worked. The people did have faith, but Ahaz didn't. He never did. You read his story and it just, it just comes up. But Ahaz was a sneaky guy. You can kind of read between the lines. He was deceiving these other uh, other nations because it said during this siege, he secretly made a pact with Assyria after this message from Isaiah, this message from the Lord came not to do so. And 
he ended up reaping the consequences. He had temporary reprieve, but it gave a more permanent, horrible result. Ahaz also was religious. He had a he had a great religious front. You know, he said all the right things. He said the right stuff for the people to hear. And he made himself look like he trusted in the Lord. He was a follower of the law. Uh, but God was exposing his heart and will expose his heart and bring to light the darkness that's there. Bianca has a question. Oh, Bianca has a question. Yes. Yep. Well, first she said that sounds a lot like what's happening today, mm -hmm. which is what we were saying. Mm -hmm. And she says, why are there more evil kings than good kings? Uh, well, man's were, heart. <laughs> yeah, in in man's heart, there were there. Uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, was on. Well, was all bad kings, because they followed the the pagan practices that were set up by Jeroboam, who led the nations away. So they followed pagan practices and rejected the Lord. They claimed they were. They were worshiping the Lord when they were worshiping the, the golden calf on the altar. But that's just put in a religious, fake, you know, uh, shine over, uh, over a rotten thing. Um, why were there more bad kings? It's just God knows people's hearts. And he knows the people. And he allowed... There were quite a few good kings, remarkable kings... In Judah uh, and quite a few really evil and really bad kings and Isaiah during his life sees both he sees some of the best and he sees some of the worst Ahaz was one of the worst later on will be one of the even worst Manasseh who uh, tradition says killed Isaiah by having him cut in half horrible you know, God allows that. God allows both the good and the bad in our lives. And when, and it's the Lord doing. The Lord uh, raises up people. And as we see here, the Lord works in history. The Lord brings the nations. He allows evil nations to have a sway. But then he judges them. He gets them. They will not win. They will get theirs. Maybe just not in our lifetime. Maybe not before our lives. So, um, all that is working out. But um, to Mr. Mister Religion, Ahaz, God now um, sort of gives a challenge. He's going to give him the, the sign of Emmanuel. So verse 10 uh, through 12. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord. Your, this is singular, this is now the you just to Ahaz himself. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or as high as the mountains. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. So like I said, he's putting on a religious front. But the Lord knows his heart. What Ahaz is really saying is like, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I don't care what, what you do, God. Pretty, pretty sad, isn't it? Okay. So this is what the Lord did. Verse 13. And he, Isaiah, and he said, Hear then, O house of David, now he's not just speaking to Ahaz. Now he's speaking to everyone. Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you all to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you, plural, you all, a sign. And this is the sign the Lord will give you. Behold. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now the name Emmanuel means 
God is with us. Hence the title of this, this message today. And we all know this verse. This is the context of the famous text at Christmas. It, it, the, the fulfillment of this is given in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Quotes this, this verse. So there's no question of the meaning of this verse in the far fulfillment is referring to the virgin birth of Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of not only Israel, but of all the world. And what did the people need at this time more than anything? They needed a Savior. So God says, guess what? I'm going to send you a Savior. It just won't be right now. But, as with so many prophecies, there is a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. The far fulfillment for this prophecy was predicting the birth of Christ, the birth of Jesus, to a virgin. The near fulfillment is kind of interesting. Probably, it was, it was fulfilled uh, by Isaiah's, in Isaiah's life himself. Because Isaiah would soon remarry a woman who, at the time he said this, is now a virgin. Um, as his wife, by uh, Shear, Yash Shear Yashub, his first son, had died. This second son that would be born to the virgin at the time he gave this prophecy would have another great name. He will be called Maher Shalal Hashbaz. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also called Emmanuel in mm. the next chapter. And it says of this, of this child that will be born of the virgin. He, verse 15 through 17. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So with this, with this prophecy of, of, of uh, the virgin bearing a son and being called Meher Shalal Hasbaz. <laughs> uh, you just want to say it. Yeah, is a prophecy of, of uh, Assyria coming, sweeping over the land and defeating Damascus as well as Samaria. So, hmm. in this term, to refuse the evil and choose the good, uh, that it talks about in verse 15 and 16, it's a Jewish metaphor, Jewish phrase uh, for a boy becoming a man and having his bar mitzvah, as they do today. Uh, Warren Wearsby writes about this. Orthodox Jewish boys became sons of the law at the age of 12. This special son was a reminder that Syria and Ephraim would be out of the picture in the next 12 years. Isaiah delivered this prophecy in 734 BC. Two years later, Assyria defeated was defeated, Assyria defeated Syria. And in 722 BC, 12 years, Assyria invaded the northern kingdom and brought about their downfall. The prophecy was fulfilled, Wearsby writes. So kind of interesting. Kind of interesting is that the double-fold prophecy, the one that we know a lot about, 
um, virgin shall bear a child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. That means God is with us. But meanwhile, back to the present, the Lord continues the message through Isaiah as we finish out this chapter 7. Uh, we read, In that day, in the day that this child hits 12, <laughs> in that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines, in the clefts of the rocks, and on all the thorn bushes, and on all the pastures. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that, uh, that is hired beyond the river, the river Euphrates, uh, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet. And it will sweep away the beard also. It's going to cut him and bring great shame. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. And because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds. For everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bows Bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. So this will be the result of not trusting the Lord, but going with what seems logical and seems sensible and putting your trust in the nation of Assyria. Like I said, that's what Ahaz did. And that was a big mistake. Because we read in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20, it says, So Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came against him, against Ahaz. And afflicted him instead of strengthening him. So Ahaz made a secret plat, plat, uh, uh, plat, uh, ha, pact. <laughs> he made a secret <laughs> pact with Assyria and sent him gold and valuable gifts from the temple and from his palace. Assyria said, thank you very much. Okay, we won't attack you right now. We'll go ahead and attack Damascus and Samaria because... That's our plans anyway, so thanks for the extra loot. And yeah, sure, we'll, we'll protect you. And as soon as they conquered um, Damascus and attacked um, and conquered a lot of the land of the northern kingdom, they had it done so and continued their attack on Judah itself. All that bribery that they have sent and hope that he have in Isaiah, in Assyria, excuse me, turned, totally turned against him. And the results was described vividly here uh, at the end of this chapter. Let me read you what Warren Wearsby wrote about this because it really helps make sense of, of this section, 18 through 25. He says, Isaiah warned Ahaz that Assyria would become Judah's enemy. The Assyrians would invade Judah and so ravage the land that agriculture would cease and the people would have only dairy products to eat. The rich farmland would become wasteland, and the people would be forced to hunt wild beasts in order to get food. It would be a time of great humiliation and suffering that could have been avoided had the leaders trusted in the Lord and believed the Lord's word that Assyria would be uh, not come against them, and that those nations that had the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria would be defeated, as they were. God knows the end from the beginning. But the story continues on to the next chapter. We're going to go through verse 10 of chapter 8. God is with us. 
but he is calling the Assyrians from the north to come and invade. Verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters belonging to Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. Now, the name Mahir Halal Shashbaz means speeds to the plunder or swift to the spoil. So, what the Lord said to do is, is, is take a large tablet and write on it using letters large enough to be read by all in common characters, in other words, with ordinary characters that even the humblest basic person can read. He said, use the, the common characters, and the Hebrew word enosh means a common man. It's contrasted with the upper ranks. So this message that Isaiah is directed to write is for all the people, all ranks of society. It's not just for the leaders. It's not just for the government officials. It's for all people, up and down, um, of society. God wants them to know. And God wants them to know this. A people are coming who will quickly go after the spoil and will be quick um, prey to the uh, loot. <laughs> Haste to the spoil. Second verse, it says, and as he does this, write the tablets and write this name, on this tablet, he says, and I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jerobachiah, to attest for me. Now this intrigued me. Uriah the priest doesn't have a great reputation in the scriptures because he complied with an evil, anti-God uh, 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 request of Ahaz. As part of Ahaz's submission to Assyria, he had to go to Damascus, which by now had been conquered by the Assyrians and become the local capital for, that, for the region, and bow the knee before the Assyrian rulers. While he was in Damascus, it said he saw the, the altar that the pagans in Damascus used and was very impressed by the looks of this altar. And so he ordered uh, Uriah the priest to duplicate this pagan altar and set it up in the temple instead of the altar of the Lord that God said to do. And Uriah went along with it and didn't complain. So it's interesting where it says in the SV, get a reliable witness, Uriah and Zechariah. Well, Uriah doesn't sound that reliable until you think about what this is. God is saying before it happens what will happen. And so get a guy like Uriah who um, will be a witness that's not likely to say, oh, this oh, this was written, this happened after it happened. This wasn't a prophecy. This wasn't a, wasn't a prediction of the Lord. There's nothing supernatural in this. This isn't anything of the Lord. You know, this was written down after it happened. You know, he couldn't say that. He was a witness that this was a prophecy. This was a prediction that had not happened at the time it was given. So Uriah <laughs> becomes a reliable man for that job. He's not, uh, uh, he, he's going to say, yeah, yeah, he has, has to admit this really happened before it happened. This was written down. That everyone could see then that what had been predicted by Isaiah has come to pass. Uh, verses 3 and 4. Then Isaiah writes, Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived, and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name 
Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. So that name was written down before this son was even conceived. Verse 4, for before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. So, approximately 19 months after that written prophecy, write down the name, Mehir Shalal Hashbaz, was given uh, this came to pass. Uh, the, the child was conceived maybe 10 months after uh, the prophecy was given. Nine months after that, it was the birth of um, Malher Shalal Hashbaz. And then adding 11 or 12 months before the baby could even cry, father or mother, uh, we have about three years in all agreeing with what, according to the commentator, agreeing with what was said in the previous chapter. So, it did come about. It did happen. It did see this. Okay, verses 5 through 8. I know it's a little confusing, so we'll just stop there <laughs> and go on. Okay, because we're running out of time. Uh, verse 5 through 8. The Lord spoke to me again. Because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah. Rezin was the king of Damascus. The son of Remaliah was Pekah, the king of Samaria. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory, and it will rise over all its channels and fill over the banks and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck, and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. What? There's Emmanuel again. He's prophesying what will happen. In the, in the time of this child, while yet a baby. So, it says, because the people rejoice over the fall of their enemies, over the fall of Samaria, over the fall of Damascus, and they thought, aha, our, our, our tactics worked. Look what our being in league with Assyria did. The Lord says, oh, don't do that. You're making a grave mistake. You're looking for... Success in the wrong place. Um, and it, you'll be taught a lesson. Okay, the waters of Shiloh was a, a stream uh, to the east of Jerusalem. Uh, it means sent. Shiloh means sent. And the water is sent through an aqueduct into the towns. It may have been the, the stream that flows into Hezekiah's aqueduct was the waters of Shiloh. It's a gentle stream. It's, it's not anything that rushes strongly. It's just a, you know, gently flowing stream, which gives a picture of gentleness and ease. That is contrasted with this flood waters that's going to come. The overflowing, as it says, of the river Euphrates this flooding across the land, the Assyria was on the north side of River Euphrates. So that when they come into Judah, it'll be like the River Euphrates flooding over the land. The water will be up to the neck. It won't be over their head. They won't be. They won't drown, but they'll be badly dis destroyed. So now it, it, it ends here. Verses 9 and 10. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. For Emmanuel, 
God is with us. So now he ends with this. Uh, where it says, it begins, Be broken, you peoples. As uh, one old commentator, it says the word, it really means raise tumults. Or in other words, rage. Go ahead. Get enraged. Come in a, come in a, 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 in a rage and, you know, determine to do your worst. Uh, but you will be shattered. You who want to come and break the people, you will be broken. You can strap on your armor, you can get your strongest weapons, but it will mean nothing because now the Lord is against you and God is with us. Thus, this, and we end here tonight with this great word of what faith brings us. Let me reread that one scripture if I can find it. Um, 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 bear with me. Okay. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Consequently, if you are firm in faith, you will stand firm. Whatever attacks might come, whatever panic might be brought, stand firm in faith. Trust the Lord. Look no farther than the Lord and see what he raises up to bring relief, for he will, because God is with us. Because of Emmanuel, that one that was born of the Virgin, and that we have put our faith in him. So let's pray and let's end. I'd love to preach the gospel with that, but uh, we all need Emmanuel. We all need Christ, for we all need God. We all want God to be with us. There's only one way, and that's through the one belief in the one born of a virgin, died on the cross, rise from the dead for our justification. So, Father God, we thank you that you are trustworthy and that you are worthy to put our trust in you. Lord, so often we get logical. We do what makes sense. But, Lord, faith doesn't make sense, usually, or much of the time. So help us, Lord, to stand firm in faith and allow you to establish us to help us stand and withstand and overcome whatever comes against us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Thanks for listening. I, I love this book. I love Isaiah. Um, next time we'll finish the second half of this three-chapter section, the second half of chapter 8, and in the chapter 9. So, uh, it's even more scriptures than this. So, you can pray for me now <laughs> for, <laughs> for good and easy time. So, God bless you. Thanks for, for listening in. Thanks for standing firm in faith in Jesus. Bye-bye. <laughs>